take out your pens and notebooks, whatever you're going to do if you want to take notes. I, I did not um, have time to get a PowerPoint point done. Um, so I just, I've been working on and, and wrestling with this message for about two or three weeks. And so I just couldn't um, get to a place where I could get the PowerPoint done. I tell you this morning, message, Doubting Thomas is not alone. I want to share, you the, share with you the story of Doubting Thomas to get us started, and we'll go from there. The story of Doubting Thomas goes like this. There's a lot of lessons to learn from it, but I want a couple of things I want to make very clear as we go through it. Jesus died on the cross and was buried. Several days, three days later, he rose from the dead. He appeared to the disciples while they were gathered together for prayer and worship. And what happened is Jesus came into the room and they all saw him. Now Thomas wasn't there. Now, I say that, I always say that, and I'm going to have to say it. What that always has taught me is we should always do our very best to always be in the house of the Lord because you never know what day will be your day of visitation. What day the Word will give an answer to you. What day the Spirit will touch you and heal you. What day the worship might change who and what you are. You have no idea when that is. So I have been, since the day I get saved, I can probably sit down and count the number of worship services, Sunday mornings I've missed in, the, in all those years. We're talking 40 years. I say that because I truly believe you never know when your day of visitation will be. But that wasn't the, the center of the story. The center was because he didn't see Jesus, his exact words to the disciples were, I will not believe until I can put my hands in the wounds in his wrists and in his side. And so, for that reason alone, Thomas was doubting. Now, I have to tell you, I always think that Thomas got a bad rap because we never called Peter sinking Peter. You know, there's a whole lot of other people that made pretty big flub ups in, with Jesus and he, they didn't get that kind of nickname, you know. We got Simon the Zealot and you got all these things, but it just him, he got this doubting Thomas. But look what happens. Following week, he made it to church. He got in there and Jesus appeared again. And Jesus approaches him and looks at him and says, Thomas, I heard you doubted that had risen. I heard you needed to touch the wounds in my hand, wrist, and side. Go ahead. And he just fell before the Lord and never talked. He never had to touch him. Seeing him was more than enough. What I wanted to talk about there was Jesus never, listen to me, Jesus never rebuked him for doubting. What Jesus said was, here I am, here are my wounds, let me quench, quench, drive out your doubt. Wow. Jesus didn't rebuke him for doubting. Now, there's a lot of things that happen when we doubt, but I want you to understand that. The second one I want to share before I get into the message is the story found in, in John chapter 9. If you want to flip in your Bible, you can go there. But it's very, very simple. A father comes to Jesus and asks him to heal his sick daughter. Jesus looked him square in the eye and said, Do you believe? Well, the father looks back at Jesus and says, 
Yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. What really what he said was, yes, Lord, I believe, but I got a little doubt. And it says, on those words, Jesus responded, your daughter is healed. Hmm. So while we look at this big issue of doubt as, oh my goodness, I guarantee you we've all had doubts during exams. Not that I really think this way, but how about sporting events? How many of you doubted the Red Sox were going to do it, you know? How many doubt the Patriots will do it? How many doubt the Bruins will do it? I don't care about the Celtics. <laughs> I'm not a, a basketball guy. Um, how many of you, you we have doubts about all kinds of things? Let me share a story with you. A Native American tribe had a unique practice of training their young braves. On the night of the boy's 13th birthday, he was placed in a dense forest to spend the entire night alone. Until then, he had never been away from the security of his family and his tribe. But on this night, he was blindfolded, taken miles away, and when he took the blindfold off, he was in the middle of thick, dark woods, all by himself, all night long. Every twig that snapped, he probably visualized a wild animal ready to pounce. Every time he heard a howl, he imagined a leap of a wolf out of the darkness. Every time the wind blew, he wondered what that sinister sound meant. No doubt, a terrifying night for many. After what seemed like an eternity, the first rays of sunlight entered the interior of the forest. Looking around, the boy saw flowers, trees, and the outline of the past. Then, in his utter astonishment, he beheld the figure of a man just a few feet away, armed with a bow and arrow. It was the boy's father, and he'd been there all night long. How many times do we doubt God? How many times do we doubt his word? In spite of our doubt. In spite of our unbelief, he still stands right next to us, watching over us. When I said that I wrestled with God, I wrestled with this particular message. Because I want people to leave encouraged and know that they can. I, I'm going to read a bunch of verses and I'm going to tell you how I felt. As I was preparing Matthew, immediately, Matthew 14, 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and said to him, your faith, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 20, 20, 21, 21, Jesus answered him, truly, I say to you, if you have the faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what was done to the fig tree, but you will even say to the mountain, be taken and cast into the sea, and it will happen. Mark 11, 23. Truly I say unto you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and tossed into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that it's going to happen, it will be granted to him. Luke says it this way. Why are your heart, why are you troubled? And why do your doubts arise in your heart? James says it this way. But he must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Further on in that chapter, he says, verse 7, he says, And let that man who doubts not believe he will receive anything from God. James says, And have mercy on some who are doubting. I mean, see, that's Jude 122. So I looked at these verses, and what I saw was all kinds of people saying, Lord, I doubt. I doubt. I doubt. And, and I looked at some of these people. He asked, he called the disciples, oh, ye of little faith, when they were in the midst of the storm. They said, didn't you learn anything? Oh, ye of, why did you doubt? 
And so I looked at this and I said, how am I going to share this with anybody? I sometimes have doubts. I work really hard not to. If I begin to feel fear and doubt, I immediately go into the Word. I immediately do whatever it takes to overcome it because I believe that fear, which we talked about last week, is an enemy of faith. That doubt, which we're talking about this morning, is an enemy of faith, and it will cause us to be hindered. The enemy wants us to fear and wants us to doubt so that God cannot move in our midst. In um, Mark or Luke, Mark chapter 5 or Luke chapter 5, I, I, I'm getting this up right now. Scripture says that Jesus went to Nazareth. And it says, because of their unbelief, how many know unbelief and doubt are the same thing? Mm -hmm. Because of their unbelief, Jesus, Jesus himself could do no mighty works, except heal a few sick people. Now, that's a whole other message. Um, but they could do nothing mighty because of their unbelief. Doubt stayed the hand of God even in Jesus. So it's a real difficulty. It's a real enemy. It's a real buster of faith. And what we have to understand is we need to know why, how, what, and how to overcome that. Realistically, all of us doubt at one time or another. Realistically, It can be difficult to have faith when the circumstances don't warrant it. Doubt may be, may be defined as a belief or lack of confidence in something. As applied to the Christian faith, it, is, it refers to unbelief in God's word, unbelief in God's ability, unbelief in God's willingness to do something. It's possible that in a moment of infirmi inf infirmity a Christian may doubt. Over the years I've had a lot of Christians question their salvation after sinning or experiencing spiritual defeat. What happens is a Christian may doubt God's goodness or his sovereignty in times of sickness and suffering, injustice, when they're opposed by the enemy, when they have financial and economic problems. But what we have to understand is that we need to recognize that unbelief in those times of doubts. Many times we try to cover it up. We try to uh, say that it's not so. Now there are, there's, there's some scripture principle to support that. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. Faith is believing those things that are not as though they are. But there's a tremendous difference between believing God. I don't know what word I want to use. And lying. Deceiving yourself. Because even though you might confess this is going to happen, you might confess the right thing, you might say the right thing in your heart of hearts, you don't believe it. In your heart of hearts, you put your faith in something else. The sickness, inheritance, the heritage. It doesn't matter. You put your faith in something else. And what we need to understand is that God can see us through those situations. During those times of doubt, we need to come to a place and first and foremost, I'm going to tell you, 
that you need to recognize the doubt. Once you recognize your unbelief or your doubt, you are on the very first step in overcoming it, or at least allowing God. The problem is when we are not honest, when we don't recognize that doubt, we hinder God moving in our lives. Sometimes we doubt because the mess that we're in, we made it ourselves. So we doubt. But I want you to understand something. Nowhere does God in Scripture say, the only reason, the only way that I'll help you, protect you, keep you, is not, is by not getting yourself into trouble. I gotta tell you, all throughout Scripture, he got all of the heroes of faith out of trouble. When they got there themselves. And sometimes, we talked about it last week, that sometimes you're in trouble because you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You're between the rock and the hard place. Between the Red Sea and incoming Pharaoh and desolation on either side. Sometimes you're right where you're supposed to be so that God can give you something a healing, a deliverance, a victory, a parting of the Red Sea, so that you will not doubt. Once you develop that history with God, you begin to doubt less and less. What happens is, Doubt enters in, and it happens for many reasons. The silence of God appears. To make us doubtful. In Habakkuk, he says, how long, God, how long will we have to endure all these things? Habakkuk 1, 2. And here's the answer. Now, this is a very um, difficult answer to tell. Habakkuk cries out to God, how long will it be like this? How long do we have to suffer? And God answers simply, trust me. Oh, boy. Sometimes that's not that easy. Where does doubt come from? Satan, the enemy, does everything he can? Began in the Garden of Eden? Listen to these words. Has not God said you shall eat of every tree of the garden? The moment, the moment he had this first opportunity, he deceived Eve. He caught, put doubt in her heart that she hadn't heard God the right way. And she was misunderstanding him. Hence, we have the fall. Job says it this way. But put forth thy hand now, touch all that he hath, and he will curse you to thy face. This is the enemy speaking. Listen, take away everything that you have, and Job will curse you. No, all of Job's, all of Job's terrifying, all of Job's pain and loss was simply because the enemy wanted him, because he was a righteous man. First Peter 5 8 says, Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may be the source. He wants to devour our commitment to God. He wants our testimony to be useless and worthless. And the two greatest weapons he uses is fear, which we talked about last week, and doubt. The devil has a plan to circumvent your life and your calling. It's doubt. To make you question God's word, God's goodness, God's ability. He wants to discourage you by saying all that the problems you have are bigger than God. To have you look at your problems as opposed to looking at God. And in doing so, feel hopeless and feel down. To make the wrong thing seem attractive to you. and bring you to defeat. Satan is the enemy of our soul. <coughs> Another thing that creates doubt in our lives is a worldview. 
world system. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 says it this way, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, that have come to naught. What he's saying is the wisdom of the world will deceive us. I read a quote, and I found it interesting. Let me see if I can find it. G. Campbell Morgan, everybody know who he is? He was a great preacher in the 18th century. By the time he was 19 years old, he already was a great preacher. But at that point, he was attacked by doubts about the validity of Scripture. He read um, scientists and agnostics, Darwin, Tyndall, Huxley, Herbert Spencer. He read the, and as he read their books and listened to them, he began to become more and more perplexed. What did he do? He canceled all his preaching engagements, put all his books in the cupboard and locked the door, went to a bookstore and bought a new Bible. He said to himself, I am no longer sure that this is what my father claims it to be, the Word of God. But I am sure, if it be the Word of God, and if it come to it, if I come to it with unprejudicial and open mind, it will bring assurance to my soul. The result, Morgan found no assurance. And in 1883, he gave, it gave him the motivation for preaching and teaching again. He devoted himself to the study and the preaching of God's word. The world can suck us in. And really bring doubt. Spiritual maturity, nobody wants to hear that. He <coughs> says this. You ready? No one wants to hear this one. Anyway. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What that really means is... Some people say it's like walking the fence. It's worse than walking the fence. Because what it means is you're a lousy Christian and a lousy unbeliever. <laughs> Unstable in everything. You're not happy if you're singing. You're not happy if you're doing this. And you're not confident in your faith. Unstable in all your ways. Got to be a terrible way to live. I don't want to tell you you're not saved because I don't know that it says that. But it says your life will be unstable. Ephesians says, Paul admonishes the Christians to not to doubt sound doctrine because the children in the faith were deceived there. And because of that, they were tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine, every slight of men, cunning craftiness, which were there to lie and wave and deceive. Conquering this kind of doubt, I'm going to tell you, listen very, very carefully. That kind of doubt can only be conquered by one thing. Anybody want to guess what it is? Okay. Um, a little more than that, but I will tell you this. As much as I believe the word is everything, it's more than the word of God. What's more than the word of God? Believing who God is. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation. Which means, I want you to understand, revelation means knowing God. The only thing that conquers that kind of faith is intimacy with God. Somebody asked me, you know, I've been a Christian since I was 18 years old. I've been to all kinds of other things. And the first thing they say is, well, how did you make it? Why do you do it? It's been 40 years. That's a long time. Do you ever not, do you ever want to go back to the world? Never. Do you ever, do you ever doubt? Not, not, not doubt my salvation, not doubt God. Why? And I, my answer is always the same. When I got saved, I had a radical encounter with Jesus. I got saved, and then I got baptized with the Holy Spirit with such power, I knew God was real. I was shaken to my bones. I spoke in tongues for about an hour. God made himself real to me. I entered into a relationship with him. And I've got to tell you, there's, I'm a very rational person. There's no way I could make a rational decision to turn my back on what I knew to be true. What battled out all those years was simply that I knew, that I knew, that I knew that God was real, that God had a work, God had a calling, that God 
always, always wants things to work together for my good. I knew it and I believed it since I was a very young Christian. Still 18 years old. That's the only weapon I know to overcome that kind of doubt. Is a relationship with now, as a byproduct of that, all kinds of other things happen in your life. This is where you need to take notes, if you're not taking notes. I'm going to quickly talk about several ways to overcome challenges. I believe in my heart that everybody in the room wants God's best in their life. You want to be able to believe God for a direction, a healing, a miracle, finances, excuse me. I am impatiently waiting for the furnace guy to come. Because the heat is really not, you can't regulate it properly. Overcoming doubt. Listen to what happens. Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, says, Elijah came near and told all the people, how long will they hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal be God, follow him. But the people not answered his word. Now, those of you who don't know the story, this is the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Where he calls fire down from heaven and slays all the prophets of Baal. Wow. That God guys. Look, you guys, what are you doing? What are you doing vacillating between this one and that? Now, we might not vacillate between Yahweh and Baal. But somewhere, sometimes, especially in the United States, we vacillate a great deal between Jesus and knowledge. Jesus and prosperity. Jesus and wisdom. And here's one that I can't stand, but it's true, even among Christians. Jesus and absolute truth. No such thing. That's untrue. At least in my opinion. I firmly believe that if it's not true for everybody, then it's really not true. So what do we do? Number one, we confess our doubt to God. It's basically unbelief. In Romans chapter 14, verse 23, Paul's talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols. And what he say, says there is, if you doubt that it's okay and you eat it, you're damned. But if you know that it's not okay, I mean that it is okay to eat it, you're not damned. And what he's really teaching us is that we need to do everything in faith, believing God, and things will be okay. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to believe God. Faith and unbelief are diametrically opposed. Doubt, unbelief, same thing. And they diametrically oppose to what God has. But if we go to him, we must be of the mind that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We need to confess it and ask God to forgive us. Much the same as the Father in John chapter 9. Yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. You ever met a Christian like that? I met a lot. A Christian who believes that God is their provider. They tithe, they give, they are truly they're blessed in that area. But they struggle with things like direction or other areas in their life. But they can't believe that God can do that. And I believe, much the same as I shared the story early, where the father of that son was there, God is right there with us, encouraging us, protecting us, 
trying to stir us away from unbelief and doubt. Pastor Barbara shared a little bit this morning. First, we look at confessing doubt. The second, I would study the Christian faith, study what happened in Scripture, and study heroes of faith, Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake, and the like. Tremendous thing. Now, I've got to tell you, I read the story of John G. Lake, and I never have had God do that to me. Um, don't know why, don't know if he ever will, um, but I find it amazing that somebody gave him exactly the amount of money he needed to get on the boat. found it amazing that a woman running through the, the line when they get off the boat is looking for a, a couple with seven children. And keeps asking until she finds you. You have four now in the house of the few. Five, no, not three. Seven. Yes, God told me to give, it, give, the, give a house to a couple with seven children. Nine of them. Whoa, that's a big deal. Has that ever happened to me? Not yet. I'm believing God will. Those kinds of assurances will come. Now, I need you to hear this for what it is. Not that you should question your salvation, but be assured of your salvation. Paul exhorts the Christians in 2 Corinthians to examine themselves and make sure they are. He says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove for your own selves. Know for your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you. And if not, then you're a reprobate. But he goes on to say, what do you, why is that so important? If you don't believe in the foundation, if you're not sure you're a member of the house of God, if you're not sure you're a member of the family of God, if you're not sure that Jesus so loved you that he gave his life, then you really will doubt everything else. I used to build houses. If you have a lousy foundation, I'm going to tell you what happens to the house. It falls down. It falls down. I remember there was a company, I, I don't want to say the name, that was making sub-grade concrete. Now concrete had to be something like 3,000 pounds per square foot, or 2,000 pounds per square foot. That's a heavy concrete hold of a house. Well, they were making it around 600. When the state found out all the houses that were made with that had to be taken down and rebuilt at the company's cost. Why? Because they know that if the foundation is weak, everything else will be weak. So make certain of your salvation. You've got to begin there. God so loved you, period. He gave His only begotten Son, period. That you might have life and have it more abundantly, period. I know I belong to Him. From there, once that's solid in your heart and mind, you can begin to quiet, quelch every dot of doubt, every fear of doubt. Faithfully study the Word of God. I don't really have to say a lot about that. We all understand what I mean when I say that. Read your Bibles. And I don't just mean read it. Study it. Find out what it means. Find examples and heroes of faith that did things that you cannot believe. Spend time in prayer. Begin to believe and exercise your faith in God. Roman, uh, Matthew 21, 20 to 22. Jesus tells this. He says, when he's the disciples saw they were raised. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what is done to this fig tree, but you can say to the mountain, go and be tossed in the sea and it will be done. If you believe you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. Jesus, in other verses, says, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you, if you believe and doubt not. Stand firm on God's word. It's the ultimate power to overcome the demon of doubt. Ephesians 4.27. Don't give any place to the devil. <coughs> means don't give him any room in your life. 
The Greek word for this is topos. It emphasizes that we can actually give ground in our lives to a satanic control. I'm going to preach a message called the satanic if in, in context of this. <coughs> I'll give you a quick few examples and you'll understand the premise. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have this filled in your own life. If God really loved you, if Jesus really was God, the satanic gift, it riddles our brain. We need to not give him any place. Don't give the devil a foot. I want you to hear something. What's the number one thing that Scripture teaches would give the enemy a foothold in your life? Doubt. No, that's a good one, no. What's number one? Unbelief. Unforgiveness. At least you give the enemy, or anger, which leads to bitterness and unforgiveness. You give the enemy a foothold in your life. Like, not the sun goes down upon the rest, at least you give the enemy a foothold. Anger. Now, anger itself won't give a foothold, but what anger leads to, which is, what will give the enemy a foothold in your life. Resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness. And scripture teaches that it can be like yeast in bread. You give him a little place and he'll take a lot. Reminds me of the book if you give a moose a muffin. <laughs> He's going to want this. And you're going to have to give him this. And you're going to have to give him that. The enemy, and what happens is, I want you to understand that the enemy does it subtly. He works his way in and next thing you know, he's having it. Doubting Thomas is not alone. All of us face doubt. All of us face fear. All of us have insecurities and wonder why when it comes to the things that go on in our lives or in the world. Some of us wonder why the world is a mess. Some of us wonder why my life is a mess. Some of us wonder why I'm in pain, why I get hurt, why I don't have enough money. Why sickness is there? Why this happened to me? And those things fan the flame of doubt in our lives. But I want you to understand something. And listen to me very carefully because you need to hear this. If something in your life is fanning the flame of doubt, Be much like that little boy, that Native American boy in the woods. Darkness everywhere, couldn't see anything, he was afraid. Doubt that he would make, make it through. But when the sun began to shine, there was his father. Right there. He faced his fear and his doubts. If you're in that place where you're fearful of doubting, Shit. Yeah. 